Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, countdown to the primary. The candidates separating themselves from the pack and who could fare best in the general election. And it's all about bringing some closure to the people that care about these individuals. Missing and murdered indigenous investigations, the role the FBI plays in these cases, and what a Navajo criminal investigator says needs to change. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. The primary election is just around the corner. In less than 10 minutes, our line opinion panelists break down the biggest races and give their thoughts on the avalanche of attack ads aimed at swaying voters. In the second half of the show, the panel discusses the recent agreement allowing legal cannabis sales on two Pueblos in New Mexico and what that could mean for other tribal communities. But of course, the spotlight remains on the wildfires burning across the state. Wednesday night, people living in Albuquerque's North Valley were forced from their homes for a short time as a fire in the bosque threatened the area. That's as the largest in New Mexico history, the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire burns in the northern part of the state. We'll explore the Forest Service's decision to pause prescribed burns and a new effort from Los Alamos Labs to make them safer. In the Gila National Forest, the Black Fire has now burned more than 160,000 acres with more than 700 firefighters on the ground working to contain it. In about 20 minutes, what the U.S. Forest Service says is being done. But first, how these fires are being handled in Washington. U.S. Senator Martin Heinrich sits down with environment reporter Laura Paskus to explain the potential solutions he's pushing at the national level. Hi, Senator Heinrich. Thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure. So you are back in D.C. right now, but you were out in New Mexico visiting the fires. We're all sort of seeing and also stunned by much of the destruction, but I'm curious if anything in particular surprised you on the various fires you were visiting. You know, looking at uh, the run that uh, the fire made west of Las Vegas, which actually happened at night when when these Ponderosa fires usually lay down and, and get on the forest floor and seeing that made that big run at night. Um, that's, that's just, it's scary. We're just seeing fire behavior and um, I've been around a lot of fires and this is, this is a lot of new behavior. And, and I think we should all, um, we just have to reassess everything based on how much things are changing. Yeah, I'm curious if you've heard anything about Hermit's Peak, Calf Canyon, if we know any more about how that fire got out of control. No, uh, I, and I think the, the question that I have, I'm going to let the investigation move forward and, and come up with a conclusion. But I think we've all seen that our, especially this year, our spring is different than it's been in the past. And I think we need to look at the windows of when it's appropriate to use prescribed fire on the landscape. And in talking to people who are sort of crunching that data at various different places, I think we're probably gonna lose the ability to burn in the spring, at least in certain windows and see that shift to times where histor historically, November and December, we couldn't do prescribed fire on a landscape because you couldn't get it to burn, right? And now, it can. So I just think, I think we need to do a deep dive on all of our forest management and, and try to update things to what is going to be most productive for our residents and for our forests going into the future and, and not make any assumptions because things are changing so quickly. You and others, um, sent a letter earlier this month to the Interior Department, Ag Department, and the Office of Personnel Management about your concerns about this federal workforce. Um, what were you worried about? Well, my concern was uh, the original timeline would have normally sort of coincided with them coming out with um, uh, a rule as to how much people in this professional class should be paid at, at what level um, and that would have sort of coincided with the beginning of fire season, but our fire season started months earlier this year, right? So we have so many people in the field right now, 
And I want to send a message to them that we are grateful that we're thinking about their professional uh, and personal well-being uh, in a way that that hasn't been fully appreciated in recent years, and that we're going to make these changes and, and to send that signal right in the middle of what we're dealing with right now, so that they feel the gratitude that I know I and many other residents of New Mexico feel. Yeah, I was really, you know, we've covered this issue of um, of the the workforce, but I was really surprised when I let, read your letter, um, which said last year fire officials were unable to fill an unprecedented 1,800 interagency requests for wildland firefighting crews and more than 1,900 requests for fire engines. Um, the letter goes on to talk about the shortages in the West heading into this fire season, with officials estimating staffing will be below 75% in some regions. Are we seeing that play out in the West and in New Mexico right now, do you think? Well, we're not seeing it in New Mexico only because right now we're the whole game, right? So you have, I believe the current number is something like 3,000 people on the Northern fire complex, that doesn't count the folks who are down on the Black Fire and some of these other fires. So right now we are benefiting as hard as what we're going through right now is. We really are benefiting from having firefighters from across the entire nation, having uh, protection assets. I mean, we, we have something like 60% of all the structure protection assets in the country. The, the big pumpkin stationary tanks that hold water, the hoses, the all of that stuff, it's in New Mexico right now. So, uh, but what worries me is we're just the front end of this, right? So fire season, even once the monsoons come, uh, it, it's gonna roll into other states. We're gonna see the California fire season. We're gonna see the Pacific Northwest fire season. We have got to get ahead of this from a personnel point of view and really start signaling and following through with it that, that we value these people because they are doing heroic work. And we need to build the professional sort of cadre um, and, and not think of this quite in the same way anymore. Really, these are, these are people who are going to be, um, these are gonna be leadership positions that inform all of the decisions we're making inside a particular national forest or other public lands. We'll get back to our response to those wildfires in a little over 10 minutes. But first, we're looking ahead to the primary election now just a week and a half away. Let's start by welcoming our line opinion panelists this week. Good to see Serge Martinez back with us. He's a professor at the UNM Law School of Law. We're also joined by two other panelists. Inez Russell Gomez, editorial page editor at the Santa Fe New Mexican, and Daniel Foley, former New Mexico State Representative and Minority Whip, I might add. Thank you all for being here. All right, early voting has started, but candidates are still getting their last shots in before Election Day. The biggest races we're following are for the Republican nomination for governor and the Democratic nomination for attorney general. Attack ads have ratcheted up in both races, but the GOP governor's race has been especially targeted with former weatherman Mark Ronchetti and State Representative Rebecca Dow jousting over who's most like Donald Trump. Daniel Foley, let me ask you this. Is this a smart strategy for the long haul for these candidates? No. Why? Not at all. Uh, you know, you got to run in the general. Mm -hmm. right? We talk about this all the time. You got to get through a primary, but you got to get through a primary in a way that you can still tack back to the middle and, uh, you know, get elected in the general election. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a, I think this is not a great uh, uh, tactic when in the general election, the president did not win the state of New Mexico. It'd be a different conversation if Donald Trump had easily won New Mexico and you were like, okay, listen, in the general, you know, he beat Biden and all of this stuff, but it, the, the state is not moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, running as far to the right as you can, and you know, you're seeing this on both sides, right? You're seeing this in the AG race with the Democrat candidates. Let's become as progressive as we can mm -hmm. to win the primary and then figure out some way the next day to move back to the middle. Um, I just I just think it's the kind of thing that, that it, it destines you for failure come general election time. Mm -hmm. Inez, interestingly, uh, Ms. Dow called Mr. Ronchetti a never Trumper. Does that work anymore at this point? It might in the primary okay. if he didn't have so much name recognition. Uh, the problem with all of the people running against Ronchetti is that everyone knew who he was because they'd seen the weather for years. And then he, you know, had a decent run for Senate. Mm -hmm. So 
no one was looking at whether you were a Trump supporter or not a Trump supporter. You were looking, I think, to see who would be the most strong against Michelle Lujan Grisham. Mm -hmm. Because that's what you're doing is you're nominating someone to run against the current incumbent. And I think Republicans are going to go with the name they know. Mm -hmm. And I also think the more you focus on Trump is the more you look backward. Elections are about the future. Right. They're not about relitigating the past. It only takes you, it can only carry you so far, certainly. I want you all to kind of get on, on this next one, but Sergio, I'll start with you. Recent polling from KOB shows Mr. Ron Ketting, Mr. Ron Ketting faring the best out of all the Republican candidates in what Inez just mentioned, a head-to-head -head race with Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. Now, poll shows the governor with a four-point lead on Mr. Ron Ketting. Jay Block had the second best shot, according to the poll. Now, are voters going to take that into account, or is it simply who they identify with most at this point? Uh, I mean, my take on it is that, yeah, the primary system is, is designed to make sure that you get the person who is least likely to, uh, you know, to, to prevail in the, in the general election, or at a minimum, it's not a concern, mm -hmm. right? And based on what I'm seeing, you know, there's some suggestion, I guess, that Ronchetti has decided to look past the, the primary because he's feeling so confident, but uh, that's not something I've noticed. It does still seem like a lot of echo chambering. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't think the average voter is going to, I don't know how uh, strategic that, that, you know, the voting approach is in the, in any primaries as, you know, looking around the country, seeing how, as Dan was saying, there's this race to the, to the, to the, you know, to the outside, a race away from the middle, a lot of times in primaries that is destructive and problematic and strategically debatable. Mm -hmm. Well, no, not debatable, just, I think, unsound. Sure. Hey, Dan, I'm interested in your opinion on this. In the polling, Michelle Lujan Grisham stacked against Rebecca Dow is a 48% versus 36% for Ms. Dow. I'm curious in the overall where you see Rebecca Dow right now, has something not caught on with the primary voters with her? I, I Honestly, I thought she'd be a little tighter to Mr. Ron Ketty at this point. What, I'm curious your sense of it. So, so Gene, let me, oh, let me start off by saying that I, I uh, I donated to Greg Zanetti. Okay. I gave Greg Zanetti some money. So I think, you know, I want to make sure we all know that, that I, my choice in the primary has been Greg Zanetti. Appreciate that. Um, I, I think that the problem that Rebecca Dow is having is a problem that happens to, we see this at the presidential level with senatorial guys, people from the Senate that run, right? You think because you're a U.S. Senator, you got all this name recognition, but once you leave your state, no one really knows who you are. Yeah. I think Rebecca has great name recognition in her district, but getting outside of your district and, pe and thinking that people in, you know, the opposite end of the state know what a state representative is doing. Mm -hmm. um, I could tell you as someone who was in the legislature and probably got as much if not more press than any legislator in living history not necessarily always good uh you'd still go places and people had no idea who you were sure. overwhelmingly had no idea who you were so so i think as inez pointed out you've got you've got a guy who's on tv that half to three quarters of the state saw every night it, it's a name whether you agree with it disagree with it whether you think you'll be a good governor don't be good it doesn't matter everybody yeah. else is coming from um you know i'm surprised what I am surprised at in this is that Greg Zanetti's name recognition isn't higher. He did run for office quite a few years ago. And for the longest time, he had that financial show on K KKOB, oh, the radio right. station, yeah. that you know that does amplify. And, you know, Larry Aarons thought that was going to propel him yes. in a governor's race. So I'm not surprised that Rebecca isn't doing as well as Mark Ronchetti. I think if you take a Mark Ronchetti out of the race and everybody is as is, without marking there, I would suspect Rebecca Dow would have those higher numbers. Right. Um, but I think it's just trying to make up for that name recognition and getting that money up front to do such a thing when, you know, it's it's unbelievably expensive to try to get name recognition statewide in New Mexico. You make a good point there. And one more, Dan, before I go to you, Inez, uh, is there anything she can do, Ms. Dow, to close the gap at this point? Or has she swung her best punches yeah, at this I mean, point? I, I, think, I think it's, you know, I think right now, you know, one of the things is, um, once early voting has started, you know, that the time for elections is so compressed now yeah. with early voting and absentee ballots, people have made up their mind. There is so much national stuff going on right now that I'm not sure there's been a compelling uh, argument or could be a compelling argument to Trump national news that's going on to get people to focus on the primary, especially when I think all indications are mm -hmm. that most people think Michelle's going to get reelected as in the general election anyway. Mm -hmm. And as let me bounce, actually, uh, Dan kind of put a good ribbon on that. Let me go to the AG's race, if I can, with you. 
Um, the Democratic Attorney General's race is the other big one, of course, on the primary ballot. State Auditor Brian Colon leading the fundraising battle over Bernalillo County D DA Raul Torres. But there's been a lot of buzz around that since Mr. Colon has received significantly larger cash from out-of-state law firms. There's been some good reporting on that. Are we focusing too much on the money in this race, not the policy perspectives of each candidate at this point? I wouldn't think so, only because their policy perspective perspectives are pretty similar. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't think there's a whole lot of space between them. And money um, can direct how you do things. And I think that's totally a legitimate point. We endorsed Cologne, but we said, you know, you're going to have to answer for where you got your money mm -hmm. and where uh, you're going to spend it and who you're going to give contracts to. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the thing we did like about Raul Torres was that he sees the office, he wants a more vigorous staffing of the office so that the AG's office, you know, trains the best and smartest lawyers, does some of the prosecution and some of the litigation itself. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad model. With Cologne, you got someone who had a more expansive view of all the things that office could do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, though, you have to look at who's giving money and who's supporting. That, that's just huge. It really is, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, Serge, you know, crime, of course, overrides the DA's race like a cloud. There's no question about it. You know, the, Mr. Torres is trying to paint himself as the law and order candidate. You know, he's got a track record that, you know, we could look at, but we often hear these types of labels in GOP races. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, is it going to yeah. work in this case? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, to your point, I think that's right. You know, Dan was saying that he thought the AGs were trying to move to the left, and I strongly disagree. It's like they're trying to get as far as far to the right as possible, at least on crime. And mm -hmm. they're, you know, I I get, I feel like there's a, you know, a word they're trying to. They think there's, you know, you get a dollar for every time you say catch and release, um, right. and it is <laughs> it, it, it is certainly um, you know the only thing and frustrating I think to someone who like me thinks the AG has actually other things that are going on in their in the job, right? And should be focusing on all the laws in New Mexico mm -hmm. and not um, just this one aspect of our constitution. Uh, but uh, I mean, I I guess it must be working because, you know, they have people more, you know, who are out in the community talking to folks and seeing what folks are responding to. Mm -hmm. I I can't watch the debates. They're just the, one, the same thing again and again and again and again. And um, I'm, I don't know if that's turning anyone off, but, you know, like Ennis was saying, there's not a whole lot of room between them anyway, so I'm not right. sure what the point is. It's, it's uh, you know, much of a muchness when you think yep. about... Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, yeah, thank I you think... all for your thoughts. Hold on, Daniel. Sorry about that. Thank oh. you all for your thoughts on the upcoming primary. We'll be keeping an eye on all the races leading up to the election. And remember, as Dan mentioned, early voting is underway. Producer Lou Divizio spoke with Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse-Oliver about that and the other changes for voters during... A New, Mexico in face, a New Mexico in Focus Facebook Live on Wednesday. You can find that on our Facebook and YouTube pages. When you tell somebody, somebody you're gonna do something, you have to do it. That's where your trust begins. They, they, if you're gonna tell somebody you're gonna be back and interview people or come back and look into this, you have to do it. The Black Fire ignited in the Gila National Forest on May 13th and has already grown into the state's third largest wildfire in history. Environment reporter Laura Pascas got a hold of U.S. Forest Service fire behavior analyst Arthur Gonzalez to talk about the conditions fueling the giant fire right now. Why is this fire growing so fast? I, I guess I would generally say, you know, when we look at fire behavior, the three things that we're looking at is fuels, weather, and topography. And so on the night of the 13th and into the day of the 14th, and, and for several uh, days following, um, all three of those elements were in alignment. And all three of those elements are kind of at the extreme end. So with fuels, uh, it's no surprise saying, you know, the Southwest is in a pretty bad drought. So we're dealing with a lot of drought stress fuels. And one of the things that complicated this area here is last summer we had fantastic monsoonal moisture. So we grew a lot of grass. So in between all those drought stress fuels, we have a lot of grass to help carry the fire. Uh, the other thing for topography, you know, in, in the Gila and Aldo Leopold wilderness, uh, it's about as complex a topography as you'll find in the Southwest. 
in terms of the topography, but also the fuels, what is the fire burning through right now? I know it's big, so it's hard to generalize, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a significant difference from the foothills, you know, grass, uh, grass and brush, a mix of some oak uh, uh, trees. And then as you climb up in elevation, transition from pine juniper and then all the way up into uh, mixed conifer ponderosa pine and, and a little bit of aspen at the very crest of the divide there. When you look at a map, we kind of start to lose perspective of, of how big this is. And this is looking over from the southeast corner and looking up um, what uh, I think that's South Palomas Creek. And this is looking down from the Hermosa country, 6,000 feet, 6,100 feet up towards Reed Mountain. That's uh, just at 10,000 feet. And so you can see the transition from the fuels down in that low grass juniper all the way up into the top in pine, uh, you know, that's looking into the Silver Fire 2013. But that's just rugged country, you know, that's, that's tough hiking just to, to, you know, that's a couple of days hike just to get up to the top, uh, let alone uh, manage fire across there. So uh, just a good example of what this fire is burning in, how rugged the country is. Yeah, you mentioned the silver fire. I'm also curious if the fire is burning through areas, you know, the Gila National Forest has done a lot of work um, with respect to fire and treatment. So I'm curious, how the fire is acting in burn scars or prescribed or treated areas versus maybe areas that haven't seen fire in a while. You're right. You know, Heliodaster Forest, one of the leaders in, this, in, in the entire country with the use of fire, prescribed fire, natural fire. Um, but under conditions like this, um, you know, it's still going to move through those units, those areas. They're designed to slow fire, uh, bring fire to the ground, just reduce that unnaturally high, uh, unnaturally uh, uh, unnatural high severity type fire. Um, so we never expected those things to stop this fire, but what it did give us is uh, an additional, um, some additional time and space to make some of the decisions. So what I've got up here, Laura, is an energy release component chart. Um, to summarize it, what this is, it's a seasonal indicator of the amount of energy available at a flaming front of a fire. This is from the Beaverhead Raws that's uh, just above the fire from 2000, 2021. The key thing here is that red line is the highest indice that has been recorded since 2000. And the gray is the average line and everybody in the Southwest kind of understands that peak there. That's just before monsoons and then we drop off. That black line is tracking 2022. And so we were setting all time highs. So this is, you know, this is conditions that we just have not seen before. Um, and, and it's definitely a month, month and a half ahead. Here's a couple, here's a slide, Laura, to, to talk a little bit about this. So um, what you're seeing here is just a, a, a Google Earth image um, in the lower left-hand corner there, you've got a, a red outline. That's the fire perimeter on, uh, on May uh, 21st, I believe there, or May 15th, sorry. And uh, that lower one, you can see how that, uh, right in the middle of that screen there, there's a yellow polygon called the South 2019. That was a wildfire that happened a, a few years ago. And as this fire was growing and rapidly pushing uphill towards the, the, the Continental Divide, you can see where this fire actually had to split and go around that fire. So that previous uh, footprint there made a significant difference in, in how fast this fire moved up. Um, and then just above that, uh, you see the top yellow polygon. That's the round fire of 2017. And uh, you could see the uh, fire moving around that. And like I say, they, they eventually moved through there. But what it did is it slowed that fire down. It brought it down to the ground. Um, very important for our firefighters. It gave them a little more time and space to make some decisions, uh, get some line prepped out ahead of that. Uh, it really slowed it down. And then uh, I'm going to flip over to uh, another photo here real quick, a photo of when that moved through that round fire that I just talked about. And uh, you can see the fire that's moved through. It's now moving off into the background there, moving across there. But the key thing is this fire has already moved through here and we can still see a lot of standing trees, a lot of green canopy. That is what the intent of those fuels treatments uh, have been able to do. So reduces the severity of these fires, um, really helps out as we continue to make progress around the north side of this fire. Uh, on that right-hand corner, you can see a separate red polygon. That's firing operations. 
that the, the, uh, the firefighters are doing to try to get ahead of this fire to box it in. And they're gonna be coming into some prescribed fire units, the uh, Area 74 prescribed fire units, the Gila National Forest conducted in uh, 2018. And those firefighters are already seeing a difference in fire. They're able to, to hold the fire, they're able to bring the fire to the ground. So uh, significant difference in previous treatments and how this fire is burning. Um, completely expected to burn through there, but it brings it down to a, a lower severity. The U.S. Forest Service has put a halt on all prescribed burns for the next 90 days. It comes as the largest fire in the country and New Mexico history. Sits at more than 311,000 acres burned in less than 50% containment. That fire started as a prescribed burn and criticism has been building since. Let's bring our line opinion panelists back in. What's your reaction to this decision, Daniel? Is it the right one for the right reasons or is this damage control for the Forest Service? Oh, it's clearly damage control, but that doesn't mean they're not getting to the right point. I mean, mm -hmm. who in their right mind in New Mexico thinks that March, April or May is a great time to start lighting fires in this mm -hmm. state? I mean, we spend three or four months of the year where Arizona blows to Texas and another three or four months out of the year where Texas blows back to Arizona. And uh, to go out there and start a prescribed burn, I do think it's highlighting a greater problem, and that is effective forest management in our state right. that we are sorely lacking. And we've talked about this before. You know, if you want to see effective forest management, head to any tribal lands in New Mexico and look at them specifically. You go to Rio Doso and you can literally see a line where Mescalero ends and the national forest starts. And this answer to effective uh, forest management being only prescribed burns is going to keep giving us what we're giving us. This is a, this is a process that takes year round work it takes cutting, it takes replanting, it takes cutting, it putting in fire lines, not waiting until the windiest time of the year to say, hey, we're going to go out there, we're going to cut a fire break, light a fire, and hope for the best. We, every year it seems like, I could be wrong, but I if, I feel like every year we have a fire in this state that is started by a prescribed burn somewhere in New Mexico, mm -hmm. and you'd think that they'd be the most equipped to realize this is not the right time to do it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if we don't effectively manage the forests up front, this is what you get. I have to tip my hat to you, Dan. You've been very strong on this for a decade plus. You have been talking about this very issue, just what you described there. And I have to note that. Um, Inez, but, you know, we have to keep in mind, they say the Forest Service conducts an average of 4,500 prescribed burns annually, treating more than a million four acres of national forest system lands, and you have to do it for the health of the forest. So it's not as if everything they do gets out of control, but, are there, you know, is that good enough? It's one of those situations where one bad mistake colors everything else you do. Right. And when you consider, you know, tens of thousands of acres have burnt, people have lost their homes. And, you know, the part of the, the state that I personally believe is the most beautiful. I mean, that's my home that, that burnt. Right. My folks lived uh, in the valley for 30 years and I'm from Las Vegas and I watched the fire come thinking my grandma's grave is going to burn up and I'll never know where she is again. And, you know, I had relatives evacuate and friends evacuate. And I looked at it just thinking, you know, what, a, like Dan said, what a stupid mistake and what a well-intentioned mistake, because having grown up there, I've seen the forest become overgrown mm. and they do need to be managed better. And I, I think if there's any silver lining in this, I believe that there's going to be some return to low level logging and wood removal in our forests, which will give people in villages like Mora and Sapio and all of those places mm. um, an opportunity for economic development that we had lost, you know, in lieu of all the lawsuits over the owl, et cetera. Right. So right. I, I think that you're not going to have big trees taken down, but I do think there's going to be a recognition that some of the old ways of managing forests were not bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Serge, the U.S. Forest, Chief, Forest Service chief says his agency needs to increase its fuels treatments, which includes using prescribed burns by up to four times current levels in the West. Does that seem feasible given staffing, resources, shortages we're already seeing now? Or do you need to hear something to, to backstop that plan to give you a little more comfort about that? Yeah, absolutely. I want, you know, something backstopping that to give me more comfort. Mm -hmm. I mean, if what they're saying is, you know, what we need to do what we just did, the same kind of thing that just set off the largest fire in New Mexico, but you know, more, 
right. is not really comforting. Um, but I mean, I don't doubt that there are extremely thoughtful folks at the Forest Service, and there's you know great ideas and you know we, um, ways to manage and predict and whatever. Um, and you know, more people, more resources. I you know think that's probably a, a good way to a good start, but mm-hmm. or, or certainly not a bad thing to throw into the mix. But I do think, yeah, saying you know we don't unless I hear. We have some great fresh ideas and a commitment and are learning from all the other folks around us, as Dan was saying, right? I mean, I'm not convinced that doing the same thing times three or four is really the answer. It's a bit of a clunk, isn't it, without some more information. Uh, Daniel, recent studies show wildfire risks for New Mexico in the entire western U.S. are only going to increase in the years to come. We all know this. Climate change is a major reason why. Uh, Kind of an oddball question here, but should the governor accelerate any of her long-term emissions goals? given how dire the situation seems right now. And you're really going to ask me that question? (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, not at all. What the governor should be doing is going to our tribal brothers and sisters in New Mexico that effectively manage the forest and say, we want to embrace what you've done and we want to bring you into into the forests that are out there that are state forests. And we want you to just do what you've done to make your tribal lands flourish during all of these times. And uh, clearly the plans we keep trying to implement, the Forest Service keeps trying to implement, pales in comparison. And we don't need grants. We don't need big studies. We just need to go to the people who have done it effectively for a thousand years Mm -hmm. and say, listen, guys, you guys do an unbelievably good job at this can help the rest of us. I think that they would jump at that opportunity. I think it would be a great opportunity to build bridges. And more importantly, I think it would get our forests under the management of people who truly understand conservation while protecting the environment and that understand that it's not an either or a zero sum equation, that you can have effective use of the forest while maintaining safe growths in the forest and giving that access to people that has worked for thousands of years we have the answers. They're right here in New Mexico. And what the governor should be doing is focusing on how do we embrace their tactics and bringing them into doing the right thing for us like they've done for themselves on tribal land. And you mentioned some years ago, it could be a heck of a jobs program as well. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, Inez, U.S. Representative, U.S. Representative Melanie Stansbury has introduced two pieces of legislation intended to address water, the Rio Grande Water Security Act and the Water Data Act. They won't have a direct impact on the fires we're seeing now, but having a better handle on the drought has to be a positive move in the right direction. Am I correct on that? No, you're right. And and taking care of the river mm-hmm. uh, and the, our watersheds is going to help uh, keep the, the foliage. I mean, in right. Santa Fe, they've planted trees along the Santa Fe River because they're trying to restore the watershed because if you have a healthy watershed, you keep your stream supply flowing and everything works a little bit better. So she's absolutely right to be focusing on the health of the river. Mm-hmm. If it's dried up, we're going to all be suffering. Right. You know, Inez, it's interesting, the politics being what they are and the severity of the problem that Yvette Harrell is a co-sponsor, <laughs> Republican on this. What do you make of that? That's very interesting, isn't it? I think it's really important for our legislative delegation to Congress to work together. I mean, I grew up in the days of Senator Pete yep. and the Democrat, and they always cooperated. And and Manuel Lujan was, you know, the congressional guy from Albuquerque and and then Steve Schiff after, et cetera, and everybody worked together. So mm-hmm. I think if we can get past, we have to hate the other side and people can work on what's good for New Mexico, New Mexico is going to be better off. Well said. Thank you all for that discussion. It's one we're going to continue to revisit as New Mexico remains the epic center of wildfire activity here in the U.S. We'll be back in about 15 minutes with one final topic for our line opinion panel, legal cannabis rights for tribal communities. The Federal Bureau of Investigations is using the Navajo language to draw attention to unsolved homicide and missing person cases on the Navajo Nation. 60 second radio ads have aired across Navajo land seeking information on a cold case, offering a reward and giving out a toll free tip phone number. In 2020, field offices here in Albuquerque and Phoenix issued posters in the Navajo language and later started including audio clips with them. NIF correspondent Antonia Gonzalez sits down with some of the people involved to ask how the initiative has been received and to understand some of the other obstacles when it comes to investigating crimes on tribal lands. Special Agent Buhanda and Captain Leslie, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Thank you. 
Uh, Special Agent, why don't you let us know and tell us a little bit about how this initiative using the Navajo language came about. So the initiative was really to try to reach uh, the communities a, a little better than we've done in the past. So what we're trying to focus on is trying to get the communication out there in a form that made sense. So we're great about talking and putting things together and putting messages out as far as an, as an organization. But we knew we were missing the one piece, which is that we weren't writing in the Navajo language, that we weren't communicating in the Navajo language. So our primary focus was just do just that, was to be able to create the posters that we had already done, that we've done a good job for over 100 years, but making them uh, posters that were in the Navajo language, and then taking it a step forward, because we realized in this process that a lot of people don't read the Navajo language, but they, can, they speak it, they speak it very well. So then it was, a it was purposeful for us to get that, uh, that message out in the Navajo language as well, through broadcast and primarily through radio. And Captain Leslie, we know that the Navajo language was used, it's well known for its use in World War II with the Navajo mm -hmm. Code Talkers as an unbreakable code and how difficult, and there must have been some challenges trying to get some information or even words uh, for the FBI use. Yes, it's, 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 a, unique, it's a unique language. Uh, you know, we sit there and we talk, we discuss that. The Navajo Nation is 25,000 square miles. So you have different uh, locations, people who grew up in different parts of the locations. There's slang Navajo and there's not. And I used to sit there and I used to listen to my, mom, my, my grandmothers. One is from Arizona, one is from uh, in Arizona. And there's different meanings to certain things and they would chuckle and, and, and start, you know, like little children. And they'll say, okay, um, what does this word mean over there? This means this and that. And it's pretty unique and, and um, you know, that's, it's, the Navajo language is unique in itself and also in writing because it's, it's pretty hard to, to write as well. So. Yeah, we weren't going to try to guess either. We just went straight right. to the experts and had them <laughs> kind of help us out. And we used people that were Navajo to be able to do this for us. The FBI is getting better, becoming a little bit more diverse, but we're far from being there. So we rely on our partnership. And the ads are both on the radio, posters, and there was some audio announcements that later went on with the posters. Have you, has, has, have the ads been successful in gathering any information? So unfortunately, not quite there yet, but it doesn't mean that we're gonna stop. We're gonna continue. I think with the next level, what we're trying to get at is to be more at the events. So it's one thing to be able to put a message out there, whether it's on a poster or to put an ad on a radio, but I think there's still that piece, and I think it's, is very unique, like in my background, being of Mexican descent and obviously understanding everyone's that we're all different. And sometimes we have to make those connections in person. So that'll be the next level of being able to continue that messaging, not only through the poster, through the ads we've done, but now going and having conversations within the community at the event so that we can continue to message that, that same theme and be able to just put a face to it, right? So let's build some trust so that you can feel comfortable reaching out to the FBI and providing us any information that's gonna help us find any of these missing individuals and some of these murder investigations that have been ongoing for way too long. And um, you bring up a good point, uh, Captain Leslie. We know in native communities across the country there is a mistrust of mm -hmm. law enforcement often. So how is the Navajo Nation law enforcement and the FBI working together to try to have build trust with Navajo people? It's, it, it goes back to law enforcement academies in my perspective. When you tell somebody, somebody you're going to do something, you have to do it. That's where your trust begins. They, they, if you're going to tell somebody you're going to be back and interview people or come back and look into this, you have to do it. They'll remember that. And if you don't do it, then the trust starts, okay, they're just coming and, you know, um, they're not going to live up to what they're, they're saying. And so when you start building that rapport and that trust with people, it, it starts coming together. And it's the Navajo people, especially the elderly, they're, they're really um, quiet, but they listen, they learn, they're observant. And when you start talking to them, you know, being respectful is number one. And that's where the, the cultural sensitivity classes come in for the FBI agents who are assigned to the, to the region. That comes in very handy and we go out there and, and we'll, we'll, you know, tag team uh, interviews and, 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 and work that way and build that trust with grandma and grandpa or even the elderly, you know, the aunties, the uncles. So, you know, that, that is a big, um, it's a momentum builder 
that's what gets the case headed in the right direction for these missing people. And so how is the FBI building trust with not only Navajo people, but there's a lot of different Pueblo communities in New Mexico as well, and Apache nations. So we're doing that in the same, in all the different areas, it's the same thing. Is uh, We're not trying to put the wrong person in front of these communities because it, we've learned over the years that that just doesn't build trust, just like the captain said. What we're trying to do is put the right people so that they get the right message across. And if we have those individuals within not only just the FBI, but just law enforcement in general. Partnering together is a huge thing it's because we want to be able to go there and get the right message because that's the only way we can build on the trust and ultimately get accomplished what we're trying to get accomplished, which is to bring some resolve. And uh, we're not going to do it. We're just trying to get in there and force people to give us information that don't necessarily have trust for us. And Captain Leslie, there are a lot of issues when it comes to law enforcement issues on the Navajo Nation and other tribes across the country, jurisdiction issues. Right. I mean, we can go down a list of I how many, <laughs> <laughs> how many, just the challenges and being a sovereign nation as well. Um, so how important is the FBI when it comes to investigating these cases? It's very important. They're a big helpful resource. The resources that, resources that we don't have on the reservation, the Navajo Indian Reservation, or any reservation, the resources that they supply, you know, the um, information, background searches, and everything that involves an investigation. Uh, you know, you start off with a missing person and you start working from there backwards to when the last time person was seen. Uh, how do we know where this person has lived? And when you have people that move on and off the reservation, they don't just live in one area. They, uh, I've had people off the Navajo Reservation, well, I work in Districts, District 3, which is the Crown Point Agency. And when we're looking for you know, a certain person to, to run a search, a background in them with them with the FBI's assistance, we'll find that they move continuously in the city of Albuquerque, grants, you know, around the, the housing uh, communities around off the reservation. And they don't live there for too long. They move, they move, and you know, wouldn't be odd. We're, we're on the right track there in New Mexico, and then boom, now they're living in Phoenix. So it's like, okay. So we have to send people down there to start doing interviews around that area as well. So it really comes in handy to resource ones. And anything to add to that? It, it's exactly. I mean, we have to leverage each other's resources. Uh, there's some different things that we're looking at from the FBI piece. So, so the one part, and it's in our name, right? We investigate things. That's one of the uh, troubling things that we've had in past years is that how does the FBI that primarily focus on, on an investigation deal with the missing piece, right? So, and I know there's, a, you know, and rightfully so, a lot of criticism about why aren't we doing more on the missing piece of, the, uh, of this big initiative. And it's primarily because it's not really something that we can put our hands around it. So as of recent, this office has taken it upon themselves to get those kind of thresholds in place so that we can focus on the missing piece and try to help our partners to try to locate some of these individuals because you don't know really at the end what it is that we're dealing with. These might be truly missing individuals. They might lead to an investigation because we find out facts about something of, as to how that happened, why they're missing, was there foul play, these types of things. So there is a piece that we can put our arms around, but uh, hopefully going forward, and this will be happening in the next several months, we'll have a uh, kind of a platform to be able to work with our law enforcement partners to really start putting our pieces and all our tools into place to help on the missing and not just the murder indigenous piece. And the state of New Mexico is one state that does have um, an initiative already to address missing and murdered indigenous um, mm -hmm. persons cases. The Navajo Nation working with both New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and even in Colorado. Right. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see work to become more efficient when it comes to missing and murdered indigenous Navajo people? It's really getting out to, out to the, you know, putting word out on the public, to the public. Uh, what it really entails. And when I say I, we've, we've worked cases where people say they're missing, and you have, you know, when I heard the term, uh, is it a legitimate missing person, I kind of scratched my head. I said, what do you mean? And I started thinking about it, and I'm like, oh, okay. What they mean is that has the person really gone missing where nobody knows what happened to them, or did this person just disappear and nobody doesn't want anybody to bother them? 
And if the public does have some information on these homicide cases or cold cases, uh, where do they go? What do they do? I mean, they could always contact the FBI, 1-800-CALL-THE-FBI or tips.fbi.gov. Uh, that information will get funneled. If it's something that we need to pass on to the Navajo Nation, Navajo PD, we'll do that. If it's something that we need to follow up on, a little bit that, that was mentioned is, so the one good piece is people do sometimes wander off the reservation, they move on to different areas, different parts of the country, and part of this platform that we're trying to build is so that we make those connections so that we can reach out to uh, these individuals and, and close the connection. And, and it might be just, just like it was explained, that uh, these individuals wanted to leave for whatever reason, they wanted to leave. So they, in their mind, they're not missing, they, they chose to. But if we make that connection and then we update our records, this way the next time that inquiry comes again, whether it's from the family or someone else, they can see when they reach out to any law enforcement agency when they query that this individual is not missing, this individual chose to start a new life somewhere else or whatever the case may be. Or there's a contact that can be given out and so you can reach this person at this number. And, and so therefore they can have that closure for whatever that case may be. And there's some others that are just gonna be that start off as you know as a missing person and you know, you succumb to the elements or an actual investigation because there was foul play. And that's something that we can continue to work regardless of whether we're talking about somewhere on the reservation or off the reservation on whatever part of the country that may be. And what can the public do on the Navajo Nation if they have some information? They can call the police department. Their phone numbers are listed. Each police district has their own phone number. They can call there, and even if it's a, a, a missing person off the reservation, they can call us and um, we'll get in touch with the local agency where that person actually originated from or the report originated from. So we do work together with uh, a lot of agencies that are off the reservation. Things have changed for the better, from my perspective, from when I first started to now. You know, everybody takes everything, you know, we try to take everything as serious as because, you know, that's a somebody's loved one doesn't matter what their, what their medical or, or even their, um, um, their uh, um, if they're not wanting to be found or if they, you know, they're, they're alcoholics, whatever it is, you know, that's still, I always tell them, that's somebody, that's somebody that you guys love. And that's the way I want to look at everything. And when it comes to this initiative in the Navajo language, what's next? So what's next is right now is just kind of that platform I was talking about. So we've been working with all the local uh, tribal partners to include BIA to pull everyone's records. So everyone's done a good job in their all respective lanes building these databases of individuals that have gone missing or these unsolved murder investigations. And But everything's done differently. We all have different ways of how we categorize and how we collect data. So we're trying to take all that data and make it streamlined so that a search on regardless of how I search, we'll give you some results if there's something to be had in that information. So we're cleaning up that data and then, then we're just gonna offer it up. We're starting with the state of New Mexico. This is where we're home, this is our home, right? We wanna make sure that we start here. We have a good test bed here to make sure that we have all our data like it needs to be. And then start to follow up on some of those leads to those, uh, to, those to try to find and locate these individuals. It's all about bringing some closure to the people that care about these individuals. These are their loved ones. These are the people they consider to be the most important things in their life. We want to make sure that we do everything we possibly can. We don't want them to feel that there's, that you shouldn't go to law enforcement for whatever the reason might be or whatever the reservation might be because we're here to do the right thing. And yes, there's always some bad apples in there, but we want to go ahead and overcome that. I think I, I would speak for both of us that there's more good that there is ever bad now. And we're all on the right path to do the right things in the right way. And if we continue on this, this, what I think is going to be great for not only the state, but for all of us all together, is that now we have a good starting point. Welcome back one final time to our line opinion panelists this week. New Mexico legalized recreational cannabis sales across the state on April 1st, as you recall, but there were still several roadblocks in place, particularly for tribal communities. But there's been some progress late last week to New Mexico, two New Mexico tribes, Pawake and Picaris Pueblos, signed an agreement with state officials recognizing the tribe's authority to collect taxes on sales of cannabis products. Now that opens the door for cannabis products to be producers and sold in the Pueblos while being taxed by the tribes, much like cigarettes and gasoline are sold and taxed now. Now how important is this step in recognizing tribal rights to cannabis? Inez, I'll start with you on that. 
the fact that they can actually legally sell, apparently, according to this agreement, is huge mm -hmm. because federal law still has cannabis as illegal. And I've been wondering how any Pueblo or Indian tribe could access this economic development tool when it's a federal crime. So if the agreement works as detailed in the articles and the descriptions, it means one more way that tribes can make money. Mm -hmm. Now, given that substance abuse is a problem and an issue across New Mexico, not just Indian country, um, it's going to be really interesting to see how many tribes actually want to do this. Mm. Because there is still the idea that marijuana, you know, reefer madness kind of thing. Um, and I know that you're not supposed to have it at Pueblos, even you know, obviously it's illegal, but it, there's just like a real prejudice against it. Sure. So I'm going to be really curious to see how they, they use that and whether they maybe produce it for sale outside and keep the money ah. more than actually selling it, you know, because the Pueblos are really small. So yeah. you're dealing with a few thousand customers at each place, and I'm not sure whether they're going to go there or they're going to take it somewhere else as a producer. That's a good, excellent point. And we know there's been, you know, issues. Picarus had issues trying to participate in the cannabis industry. You know, as recently as fall of 2021, federal officials raided a household garden. You might remember that. 2018, yep. federal officers destroyed a medical grow operation. Um, Serge, does this agreement help rectify some of that, the resentment that might have caused? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it rectifies the resentment, but... Yeah. You know, the whole point of this these, this agreement that uh, Picaris and Powaki have with the state are, you know, these um, these these arrangements are intended to sort of tell the feds to back off, to say, right. you know, to sort of to to bring what's going on in the tribal lands, you know, closer to the to the part of cannabis production and, and, and regulation that the feds have said we're not going to get involved in. Right. And so, you know, it's not entirely clear that that it's going to be, you know, this effective, you know, stay away from us uh, tool. But that's the whole point of this, right? Because tribal cannabis, you know, rights are in uh, a bit of a legal gray area and have been contested, and you know, you, it, the feds are unpredictable about how they're, it depends on who is the, you know, the U.S. attorney in your area or mm -hmm. who's who's calling whatever shots. And so this is an attempt to to provide some security, some some you know predictability to this. Uh, so hopefully, you know that will be effective. Mm -hmm. You know, Daniel, leaders at both Pohake and Picaris Pueblo say they're pleased that they'll have an opportunity to participate in this industry. You know, but the big one hanging out there, of course, is the Navajo Nation. You know, there's been Inez's paper and others have done stellar reporting on the illegal growing operations that were out there with all kinds of problems that that happened there. Might that be a stumbling block to some of these agreements for other tribes to make similar agreements in the near future? I think the agreements would help curb some of that problem, okay. right? Because if you had it regulated on the, the tribes and Pueblos, I think this is going to be much bigger. This is going to be a much bigger issue than I think anybody's giving it uh, attention today, because I think this is going to become ground zero for the Fed's discussion about states' rights ah. versus uh, tribal rights versus sovereignty. I mean, I'm not sure what other states have entered into these compacts with Native Americans, with tribal entities, but you got to remember, no matter what happens, the tribal entities, right, wrong, or indifferent, still answer to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Sure. And you still have the feds. And the feds have been very clear that they're not on board for this so far. At the end of the day, um, I think they're going to be Johnny come lately to this. I mean, there's there's you cannot make a legitimate argument to criminalize the use of marijuana in New Mexico when we legitimately use drugs that are 10 times worse, prescribe them every day, alcohol, tobacco, everything else. And I think that this could become one of those landmark decisions that you may see in not too long of a time before the Supreme Court, where the state and the tribes partner against the feds, maybe in, maybe in the next few years, maybe after the next presidential election. You never know. I mean, there seems to be a lot of things going on mm -hmm. that seem to be more important than fighting weed right now in this in the, in the country. But as you said, it just takes a prosecutor, right? You get someone as the U.S. prosecutor, the U.S. attorney in New Mexico that says, I'm going to fight this, or you right. get somebody at the head of uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs or the FBI, because remember, any crimes that are on tribal land, it's the FBI that does that. Mm -hmm. And this could be escalated quickly that says, listen, because this is really going to draw the line and I think highlight the difference between states' rights, 
tribal sovereignty and the federal government's overreach and overuse of force and power on tribal lands. And this could become a real uh, this could become a real a real decision making case, I think, going forward. I think they need the opportunity. I think if I was to gather paying attention to this, I think what will happen, there will obviously be some uh, retail facilities on tribal land. But I think you're going to see them in the growing business much more than they are in the sales business, meaning they're going to be huge Humboldt County type entities that can distribute this stuff throughout New Mexico. They have the, they have the number one thing that's needed that they'll never run out of. And we talked about it earlier. Yeah, water. That's right. Inez, pick up on that if you would. Some good points there. I think um, that both Serge and Dan made great points mm -hmm. about the idea of whether this agreement is going to stand scrutiny from the feds. You know, after all, when you go back to the, what happened at Pickery's with the raid on the guy that was growing pot in his yard, mm -hmm. um, someone decided that was a good idea. And there will be a federal prosecutor making a name for himself or, yep. you know, believing that the federal uh, will is, is supreme, who's going to say, I don't believe these agreements stand up. Mm -hmm. I mean, the clear way out of that is for Congress to legalize marijuana. And then we don't have to fuss over this and people can develop their industries and business as they see fit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, someday someone's going to figure out that that would work and they're going to pass that law and all of this patchwork of things will go away. Dan makes a good point, though. It takes something to push that forward. And I think this might be it. And he yeah. made a good case for that. Thanks again to our Align panel, as always, this week. Be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics the line covered on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram pages. We'll see you again next week in focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you.